Hello, everyone. We are so excited to have everybody here today to launch our Tiger Global Case Competition. Um, we have our amazing judges here with us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can see uh, a little bit of what we are going to get up to today. All righty. Um, so officially welcoming you guys to the Tiger Global Case Competition 2020. We are absolutely thrilled to be working with Tiger Global um, and other partners for this amazing event. Um, welcome to all of you guys as you know, you students. We are so impressed with how much initiative you guys have all taken on really improving um, your business experience and you know, wanting to get involved more with your education. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to our judges who have put in a lot of time and are really excited to obviously see all of your guys' case proposals over the next few weeks. Um, before I jump into introducing them and getting to know them a little bit more, um, I do want to you know, thank our principal partner, Tiger Global, as well as our official sponsor, um, PricewaterhouseCoopers. We are very thankful for their support um, and it's going to be an amazing event. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I myself am Amanda. I am on the Crimson United States team, um, contrary to my name on here being Crimson Australia. Um, I'm located in San Francisco and I have worked with Crimson for about two years now, um, you know, hosting events and creating assets for students on their college admissions journey. So very excited to be working on this global competition with everyone. Alrighty, so let's dive in and meet your guys' judges. Um, so first and foremost, we have Sanjeev, um, who is the COO of Femto DX, um, which is actually a biotech startup for molecular diagnostics and making them accessible. He is a passion entrepreneur um, and is a co-investor of actually seven US patents, which is pretty wild. We also have Stacy Pena, who has worked in communications and technology for years, serving some of the largest companies like Apple, IBM, Cisco, as well as smaller companies, kind of helping these startups articulate their value proposition to you know, the world. Um, Stacy currently is the lead communications for Stanford University's Institute of Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, insanely cool. Um, and attended UC Davis where she got her degree in communications and English. Then we also have Pablo here with us, Pablo Mendoza, who is a technology investor at Buy Capital. So he works with companies in the growth stage um, in not only the United States, but Latin America, Europe, Asia. Um, he's also worked at Goldman Sachs, which is a you know, very well-known investment banking company. Um, and got his degree from Columbia University where he majored in Latin American studies and business management. So we have quite the panel of judges for you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive in and start asking you know, our judges some questions to get to know them a little bit better. Um, all right. So um, first and foremost, Stacy, I would love to hear from you, you know, what is, one piece of advice that you would give to someone starting out their career? So I think for those of us who had an idea of what we wanted to do for a career and spent high school and college working hard towards that idea. And for me, I, knew, I didn't really know what communications was in the corporate world, but I knew that I loved writing, I loved graphic design, I loved events, I loved all these different things, which culminated in actually a career in marketing communications was the first thing I did. Um, so I think for those of us that are really on a path, it's important to stay open-minded and flexible and important to be open to learning experiences because you never know what each job opportunity is going to present to you in terms of your next step or your next opportunity. And I think if we start out in the working world with too much of a tunnel vision on what we think our goal is, then we might miss out on other opportunities that could be an even better fit for us. Absolutely. You never know what's coming your way. So having that open mind is incredibly important. Um, Pablo, a question for you. Um, how and why did you choose your career path that you're currently on? Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. I love your peppy attitude, man. It's really happy. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Pablo. Just for everyone's listening, I'm a VP over at VY. We invest in tech companies, uh, companies that you've heard of, probably like Reddit, like SpaceX, etc. It's fun times. Um, when it comes to thinking about career, I find that, especially in a position where I didn't really have a roadmap laid out for me, I leaned a lot on my mentors. And so I think jumping into a room and kind of looking around and seeing you know, who's interested in something that I'm interested in? Who do I see that, you know, seems to be doing well in instances or things that I might be wanting to do well in? And I think kind of seeking those people out and being proactive about building genuine friendships actually really does go a long way. Um, I can honestly say that in every fork of my career, whenever I was, you know, got lucky and was successful enough to get certain internships or jobs, uh, I can point to a few people that I had a relationship with or a friendship with or a networking relationship with that if it wasn't for them, I would not be there. And they provided the guidance that I needed to be able to get where I wanted to be. And so I highly urge you guys to really, really be proactive in terms of engaging the people around you, looking for mentors and kind of proactively seeking guidance because that's how you create spontaneous things and spontaneous things lead to really great opportunities. So, you know, really get involved with people that you respect and, and build a lot of really close relationships. Absolutely. Um, you know, speaking on that note of mentors, I saw we had a question um, come in. Just a friendly reminder, if you guys want to drop your questions in the Q&A box, um, it'll allow us to make sure we can get to as many as possible. Um, but on the topic of mentors, Stacey and Pablo, what do you guys think is the best way to find mentors? I feel like sometimes, you know, the, the concept of mentors is a little foreign and daunting to high school students. Um, so what advice do you guys have for students that are looking for that mentor relationship? That's a good question. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to feel that. Um, I would say look for things that you have in common with others, and it can be anything. Like you know, when you go on a date and like you, you're like you're trying to connect on anything. Like literally, it can be sports. It can be the news. It can be what you're interested in. I think the best way you can really and you build genuine like the same way you like kind of make your best friends. You really do the same thing in building mentorships. Um, I think in terms of targeting who you want to be your mentor, it's kind of a little bit halfway, half and half in terms of it happens kind of genuinely on its own. But you'll find that you really do draw yourself to people that are similar to you, right? So, you know, for me, take banking, for example, even though banking's like 80% white bougie people, I was able to like kind of tap into a network of kind of professional Latinos that I really identify with and really helped me. And like, I could tell that they were incentivized to help me because we kind of shared that minority background type thing. And if that's not the only trait, but there's, that's kind of one example. So like really look at things that, look at people that you think have commonalities with you and would want to help you. And then just really work to build it and be noticed. Sometimes it could be something as simple if it's, if it's random, send a LinkedIn message being like, hey, I know you're busy. And don't do the cookie cutter like, this is me, I'm interested in investment banking. Like, just be like, hey man, like, I know you're busy, know the office is crazy, but I'm really interested in my background, I'd love to get a few minutes. Um, and last thing, it's a probability game. So if you email someone or try to like find a mentor and they say no, don't take it personally. Um, it's like swiping on a dating app. Like you really, you have to play it as a probability game. And like for every 10 people you talk to, nine people you won't really jive with, but for one person you will. And so the same way you make friends is, is kind of how you end up making mentors. And I think also you can think of mentoring relationships that there's kind of a spectrum. There's an official mentoring relationship where both parties agree and even have a discussion about what they're going to get out of it and the frequency with which you're going to meet. Um, so a commitment to each other. So that's like an official mentoring relationship. But, but don't underestimate the value of like informational interviews and just kind of tapping into people as mentors, even if it's only one conversation. You could learn something or that yeah. person could introduce you to someone and completely change your life. Um, so reaching out to somebody through social media or, you know, any other way through your network of friends or family or acquaintances to say, Hey, can I just have 15 minutes of your time? I just wanted to ask you a few questions related to your profession and you never know where that could lead. But if it's only a 15 minute conversation, you might still get something out of it. Definitely. Yeah. Before I, uh, officially chose my major in college, I just had coffee chats with a bunch of family, friends in different industries and learned about their various paths because they had obviously all had such different experiences um, and it really helped me narrow down what it was that I was interested in and where I could see myself um, what industry I could see myself evolving in so yeah that was also all really good advice. Um, Stacy, a question for you. Um, what values are you committed to and why? 
So I actually, um, this past year, did a professional development workshop where I had to really identify my values. So I actually have a list that I had given careful consideration to. And the list I came up with was authenticity, kindness, excellence, integrity, collaboration, and positivity. And I would say it's super important to identify your values um, because that is your criteria by which you can judge job opportunities and companies. It gives you a way of asking questions when you're trying to see if there's a fit somewhere to see what that organization or that hiring manager values. Um, and your values also serve you really well when you're in a tough situation where you feel challenged and you possibly feel morally or ethically challenged in a, in a situation. You need to know what you believe and what you stand for and what you're not going to compromise on. Um, because if you don't, you're likely to get pushed around or pushed into a situation you regret or saying something that on um, reflection you wish you didn't say. Um, and it also helps you make those choices. You know, you're going to have paths and choices to make and understanding your own values, knowing your values and making decisions in alignment with your values is always going to lead to the greatest job satisfaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, individually and as a team, you know, with Crimson in the U.S., we set values and goals um, multiple times a year. You know, your values, um, as, as much as they are a core to your, um, you know, your mission, they do change and your priorities change. So um, it's very important to kind of continuously evaluate what is most important to you. And um, that's how you will communicate yourself as well to companies and teams. And it's, yeah, incredibly important. Um, Pablo, a question for you. Um, what are the main qualities you look for when hiring and how do you think students can develop these qualities through their extracurricular activities? Yeah, sure. Um, great. Uh, so in terms of hiring, I think I would divide it into two buckets. The first one would be, and you're going to hear this a lot more as you grow up, it's going to be either EQ or IQ. Um, EQ is going to be emotional intelligence. Are you relatable? Do you make friends quickly? Are you uppity? Um, are you kind of a go-getter? Are you scrappy? People nowadays love scrappy. Like if you use the word scrappy in an interview, like everyone just loses it. Scrappy's great. Um, so that's kind of the EQ side. This is more the networking side. And so from there, you kind of want to see someone who's kind of proactive, who's reaching out, who's good at communicating, who's good at posting, who's good at saying, hey, got it, I'm all over it, but also good at saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can we do it again? Can we run it through again? Who's good at saying, hey, I told you it's gonna be done in an hour, but this popped up, can I get it to you in another hour? If not, let's like figure out a solution. Like someone who's like really kind of proactive and on top of things uh, and easy to work with and friendly. So that's the EQ side. The IQ side is kind of more the hunker down, know the material that you need to know for things. And so that's kind of more the technical. So when we think about finance, that's like knowing how to do basic valuations. You don't even know how to model, but knowing how theoretical company valuations work, how M&A processes work, like showing that you've done enough reading and studying to know the technical materials associated with the job. Um, I think one thing that I find happens a lot with individuals is that they'll focus on most, probably 90%, 100% of their time on the technical when they're kind of learning, okay, what do I need to study? What content do I need to know for this interview? But where you really differentiate, and I think where I see a lot of people kind of trip up is where you know they've kind of studied all this, but then they come in an interview being super like, oh, I'm a genius, I know everything. And then I'm like, oh, are you? And it's like, I've been doing this for four years. I've been like, I'm gonna write because I, I don't like that, right? But if you come in and you're friendly and you're passionate and you're answering well, like I think differentiating the, the IQ is something you can really do well in interviews. Um, in terms of the IQ side, is like yeah, definitely. How do you think students develop that through extracurriculars? I mean, it's so easy to just, well, so easy. You know, it's very typical yeah, yeah, yeah. to get a leadership position and run with it. But how that's, else do students do that? That's a fantastic. That's a really, really great question. If you want to get a really, really good job coming out of college, step one is obviously your grades. Step two is your extracurriculars, and not just your extracurriculars, but like what leadership positions you hold in those extracurriculars. Why do I or other employers care about that? We care because a lot of the things you end up doing in these clubs are very transferable to the jobs you'll be doing. And this isn't the technical work. This isn't the modeling. This is the sending emails, uh, doing a board election, and having this person create drama. 
trying to organize an event and having a conflict with another space and figuring it out, um, getting budgeting done, making sure that your budget's okay, spending your budget. So a lot of those things that you do in extracurricular leadership roles are actually very transferable, um, I guess, to my field. I mean, there's always, if you're going to be a coder, like, you can honestly talk to no one and you'll do great. But in, in kind of what I work in, I think people love leadership and extra failure just because they know that, okay, if I hire this kid, like he might not know much, but I know he's spunky. I know he knows how to like kind of figure things out. I know he's been the president of this. So like he's kind of taking initiative. Oh, we'll figure it out. Right. And so extra curriculars are honestly in my head a must for sure. Well, and I think the other thing about extracurricular activities is it's such a tired piece of advice to say like, follow your passion and what are you passionate about? But it, it's really true in that respect because like for me, when I was in high school, I was editor of the yearbook and managing there of the newspaper and I did similar things in college. So it's like, if you are passionate and have an interest in some area, go join it, go try to be in a leadership role and something that you genuinely love to do. And it's amazing how it can add up to a career or something that's related to your career. And then when you start applying for jobs um, or college, they look at that and they say, oh, this person wants to be a communications major. They've been involved in all these related activities. So it shows a demonstrated interest and commitment to whatever that field is that you're pursuing. So it helps a lot in that way, both for your own learning, but also demonstrating to people who are gonna judge you that you truly are interested in that. Absolutely. Um, those were wonderful answers and very, very helpful for students, I'm sure. Um, awesome. So I have a couple questions here from the Q&A that I'd love to dive into. Um, Can I answer Esmond's song? Yeah, for sure. Sweet. I thought that was a great question. <laughs> um, I really like your question, Edmund, Esmond. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name correctly. Um, happiness or success in a week? Believe it or not, they're actually pretty conjoined. So people think, so you guys are all question, asking questions like, oh my God, like how did you meet like-minded people? How did you meet a network? When I was your age, I was asking the same questions, and honestly, I, I didn't know the answers, right? And I don't think anyone could have given me the answers. I think when it comes to happiness and success, it's little victories. So it's, it's very much the metaphor of like, yeah, it seems like a giant mountain to climb to get to like exposition or dream job, but really what it is, is a series of very, very small steps and wins. And so like, that doesn't just apply to work, that applies to life. So every day I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna call this person. I'm gonna do this type of exercise. I'm gonna make sure I get these two things or three things, projects for work done. I'm gonna make sure I check my email X amount. And then as long as I'm kind of getting those wins, they motivate me. And at the same time, they're making sure I'm in touch with my friends, making sure I'm doing well at work, making sure I'm on top of things. And so I think I would define success not as like a giant one you know, NBA game, you win or you lose, but rather set small goals that are realistic, complete them, and then just build on them. Like when you're networking, find one person, just one person and connect with them. You don't have to find a million people and then slowly, you'll learn, right? And every interaction, every experience you'll learn. And so I really think take success in small steps and take it in stride. If you, if you mess up, if something happens, it, it's like natural. If anything, if you're messing up, you're probably doing it right. And you're putting yourself at enough risk at your age to do well later on. Definitely. You know, on the note of networking, um, Stacey, I'd love to hear from you on, I guess, strategies for networking. You know, it's, it's very easy to make initial contact with people, but maintaining those relationships throughout your career that, as you mentioned, might open doors that you never expected. Um, how do you nurture those networking relationships? Well, I think it's important to be a joiner and uh, an attender of events and things like seize every opportunity that comes your way or that you're aware of to go listen to a speaker to be in this club with you know common interest to attend this event so so much of the time i think we have opportunities in front of us and we think i'm too busy i don't have time to do it or i this you know i might not enjoy myself or i might feel uncomfortable in that setting and i just think it's so important to overcome all those impulses and to actually put yourself out there and when you do go to the event or the conference or the meeting or whatever, walk around the room and introduce yourself and start talking to people. And I think we have to get out of our comfort zones if we're going to build our network. And then you got to keep in touch with those people because it's one thing to like exchange contact information, but um, actually, you know, ask, ask that person out to lunch a couple months later and say, hey, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, like have a specific goal in mind. But take those proactive steps and then it starts to come back to you and feed on itself because they, they become true relationships 
but just be ready to do the work in the beginning and be ready to feel uncomfortable. Like anytime you feel yourself thinking, I might not be comfortable with that, it probably means you should do it. You're gonna learn something. Yeah, that discomfort is, is daunting to high school students, but if there's anything I've learned, you know, in the couple of years of working full time, it's that that discomfort is really important because otherwise you're not gonna make any forward movement in your career or your networking. Um, if you don't take those, you know, risks and those steps. So that's really wonderful advice. Um, I really like this question that came in. Um, when working with a team, what is a great way to motivate your team members and making sure that you're working as efficiently as possible? And I, I pose this to any of you guys. Yeah. Um, if it's too late, you can't hear me right now. Uh-oh. Pablo's audio. It's a little. Maybe. All right, right, right. Like Pablo, um, might have Okay, well, I'm going to answer that question while Pablo gets his audio back. Yes, I absolutely love working in teams, and I do a lot of cross-functional leadership in my position, where I have to actually manage teams where nobody reports to me. Um, so I think it's really important to motivate people by making sure everybody understands the goal and everybody feels connected to the goal and everyone feels valuable, um, that their actions and their efforts are valued. So as long as you can be mindful of all that and make sure the objectives, the connection, the value is imparted, then I find people are so willing to jump through hoops for you to get something done. When there's confusion and they're not quite sure why we're we doing this or what are we getting out of it? Does it even matter if I'm here? That's when you start losing your team. Absolutely. And Jeeva, I can chime in a little bit. First of all, my profuse apology for the delay. No uh, worries. So, Happy to have you here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Stacy's point about cross-functional team is a very important one. Uh, keeping in mind that it's easy to get job done from your team if you have a formal authority because they report to you. But if you are managing a cross-functional team, and uh, that really, in my mind, is a true uh, hallmark of leadership. Getting work done from a team that does not report to you, and it largely boils down to managing by influence. And uh, if one can master that art, managing a large team, a direct large team, uh, becomes, uh, becomes uh, a lot more, lot more easier. Definitely. Uh, you know, a lot of that comes back to communication. Um, Stacy, you know, you've spent your career in, in communication and um, it's not something that comes naturally to everybody. You really have to work at it. You have to learn how to work in various team settings. Um, and, you know, you students are getting wonderful experience with that in this case competition, but it doesn't stop there. Put yourself in different types of team situations. Um, you know, school group projects are one working um, being involved in a club or an organization on campus, um, all of those are going to teach you the various ways to communicate with different people and everyone has a different communication style. So it's incredibly key and essential to working effectively as a team. Yeah. Sorry guys, I cut off. Um, no worries. It's, uh, it's, I'm not the only one in, in this building. Anyways, um, so never, ever, 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 ever write I. Never write I, just don't do it, never do it. Always write we, no matter what. And don't even use like personal pronouns. If you're in an email like hi, instead of saying I will go to the park, write we'll go to the park or we will go to the park. Just never write I. Remember me when I tell you this, never write I. That's all I have to say. Great snippet of advice, Pablo. Um, I'll just uh, add a little more color to what Pablo said. Uh, I totally agree with that advice. And in addition, I would also add, uh, never be eager to take credit, give credit to others. Good things, uh, when good things happen, a good leader looks out of the window saying others made it happen, right? And, uh, and if you are working as part of a team and uh, take the ownership of a problem, if you, things go wrong, and if you are leading the team, if you are a leader of a cross-functional team, for example, that's the time to look in the mirror and take the ownership. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, this is all such wonderful advice. I'm gonna um, ask one more question before I give 
just some final logistical details to um, all of you participants on the case competition. Um, but, you know, this is a competition and it can be stressful and there's deadlines and there's all sorts of, um, you know, nuances involved in the process. What is one way that you guys stay calm while working in high pressure situations? I can, uh, Pablo, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to go first. I think it comes, you know, I mentioned the successes or small steps. I think two things. First, when you have a lot going down, going on, always remember what's priority. Usually when you have five things going on, um, two of them matter a lot and like three of them kind of matter, but like if you were to talk to people the right way, they would understand. So I would say first thing, always prioritize, be game plan. So like, okay, what are the steps for me to get these priority items done in a panic, like in kind of a, a they call it a fire drill. Um, and then step three, mentors and friends. So I think a lot of the times where you're stressed um, is actually less because you're really, really busy. Just because if you're really, really busy and you know what you're doing, it's just time actually just flies by and you just do it. It gets stressful when there's a lot going on and you actually don't know what you're doing or you're not sure of what you're doing. And so be sure that when that happens, you find someone to reach out to. Um, initially in your peer network, if it's something that you realize none of your peers know, then you're probably asking a good question and it makes sense to escalate to maybe a team leader or like, I guess one of the judges or one of the moderators or whatever. But like, I would say kind of take that approach. Always like kind of take a step back, understand what matters, what doesn't, how you're going to get it done and who's going to help you. Yeah. Um... I would add that uh, it's also important that uh, as you are progressing uh, in any project, you know, there will be situations where you will face challenges like uh, uh, stressful situations, but also not to forget to celebrate small successes just to keep the whole uh, situation very balanced. And uh, uh, like Pablo said, I think it's worth uh, uh, reiterating, just step back and recalibrate in terms of uh, the priorities of what is the single most thing that you want to accomplish. And is it a matter of reallocating your team resources? Is it a matter of uh, redefining what the metric of success looks like in order to meet the goal? But it's always a good idea to kind of sell, uh, to step back uh, and uh, take a take a fresh perspective at things, and uh, uh, reaching out and cultivating mentors always very very important. And I would add, it's always good to say to yourself, "What's the worst thing that can happen if this doesn't go well or if this fails?" And often, when you talk yourself through, you realize that won't be that bad. I can manage that. I can handle that if it happens. And the reality is. If the worst thing that can happen is total failure, guess what? You're gonna learn something from it and you may even look back and be glad that that thing happened. Absolutely, you know, one note I'll give to that in relation to college admissions is some of the best personal statement essays come from moments of failure. Um, it shows how you've grown, your ability to reflect on your experiences um, and that will only, you know, prove to admissions officers that you have the ability to work through high stress situations and still come out of it with a really positive attitude on the other end. Um, so we are just coming up on time. I know we're a minute over, but I wanna give a couple of uh, important dates and stuff that are coming up over the next two weeks for the case competition. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen really quick. Um, so let me, there we go. Um, so dates coming up, the case is being released, um, it's being released uh, at midnight uh, Pacific time. So I'm sure when you guys wake up in the morning, you will see it. Um, there are a couple of, you know, workshops and sessions this weekend as well. Obviously they're um, later or in the middle of the night in the US, but they will be recorded. So you guys will all have access to watch them um, later on. On the 12th is when your digital submission is due. Do not forget these deadlines. Um, if you have any questions about it, feel free um, to, you know, get in contact with all of us, but very, very important deadline. Um, on Monday the 14th is when the 10 regional finalists will be announced. 
on the 15th, you will be delivering your pitch. And on the 19th is our larger session um, where our incredible judges will be um, yeah, evaluating and you guys will be, the, the 10 top will be presenting to the judges. So yeah, take a screenshot of this if you need to, have it as your background on your phone, keep it in mind. Um, and as I said, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I wanna give a huge thank you to our judges who are here today. Um, you guys will get to know them more as you give your pitches and stuff like that, but their backgrounds and taking time out of their day, we are immensely appreciative. Um, so yeah, good luck to everyone and have a wonderful long weekend. Thanks everyone. Bye.